Guys, how you doing? First, we were going to talk about is Italian ryegrass. This is not something you're going to find emerging right now. What you're more likely to see is something like this. Big, tall, brown stuff out in the field now that's inhibiting crop growth. That's what it looks like right there in October, November last year. And our farmers, unfortunately, tend to ignore it. And they wait and try to do something in the burn down and they get ineffective control. You end up with what looks like this. And if you look, you probably can remember riding around, seeing this. And all this is going on when you're probably in school or doing something else. This is the effect of it on corn. That one single plant per seven row foot of corn. So one plant and seven feet of corn, a row of corn, reduces yield 60 some odd percent. Think about that. So it's not a matter of you telling Tim that you see it for controlling it. He can suggest a use of herbicide now. It's let him know, hey, it's out here so he can plan to advise his growers this coming fall. Because that's the best way to combat it, is catch it when it's right here. So keep that in mind. Look for stuff, there's big dead plants that you'll see. Or if you're checking corn, something like this. Any questions on ryegrass? It's pretty easy to see. If you ever see it when it's younger, it's uh, real shiny. It's got a waxy coat on the leaf, it just really shines. You can pick it out pretty easily in a field, even if it's small. The next one is horseweed, also known as mare's tail, used synonymous. His actual taxonomic name is horseweed, though. This is a, at one time was a winter annual weed, predominantly in the Midwest. It has moved down into Arkansas, first identified as resistant to Roundup, which the Italian ryegrass is too. Um, identified as resistant to Roundup uh, in Delaware back in uh, the late 1990s. Then it moved into Tennessee and it's kind of spread and it's really exploded here in Louisiana, particularly over the last three years. It's always been here as far as resistance, but it's exploded. That's kind of what it looks like. There's a lot of weeds that look like it in Louisiana because if there's one thing that we have, we got plenty of plant species that we call weeds because you know what a weed is? A weed's a plant growing out of place. So if you put a cotton plant, beautiful cotton plant, in your mama's tomato patch, she ain't going to like it. You put a tomato in the middle of a cotton field, you ain't gonna like it. So they're both with just a plant growing out of place. Same principle with this weed. Okay, we got lots of different species that grow on roadsides, go around that you can mistake horseweed for. One of the biggest ways to tell it is these white flowers. But even then, it may not be horseweed. That doesn't matter. We got to get it out. This is a winter annual that is beginning to continue to emerge into the spring. Generally, when it gets hot, it kind of stops, right? It is resistant to glyphosate, so it is tough to control. But if you see small little things like this, if you tell him there is things that he can do to control it, he can advise a farmer to do. When it gets to this point, you got big cotton with big mare's tail growing in. That's not the best picture right there because it's wet as all can get out in that field that day. There's not really much that we can do for this one right here. But knowing it's there will help for planning in the future. So let's move into things that we can do something for right now. We're gonna talk grasses first. This is barnyard grass. You see this plant, this stem is kind of shaped almost uh, like this. All right, so that aspect you're seeing is turned to you like that. You pull that plant up and flip it in your hand, looks flat, okay? That's about the only grass species in Louisiana that you're gonna see do that. So it's real easy to tell. So from the side aspect is this way, and then you get skinny. I wish I could do that. I look at you this way, I'm wide, I wish I could do this and be skinny, but I gotta lose some weight to be able to do that. That's the one that's a little bit bigger. Here's a seed head. What you'll see, you'll also hear it called jungle rice. Technically, this is jungle rice. Barnyard grass would have arms, which is a little spike sticking out of here, but we know it's synonymous with barnyard grass. The biggest issue we're seeing with this weed now is glyphosate generally will control it if you hold your mouth right. If it's small or big, don't matter, and it's dry or it's wet, 
Roundup doesn't do a good job, and that's shocking because generally Roundup kills all grasses. We think it's a hammer, not on this particular plant. Then when we go out with any of the dicamba formulations that we use, so an extend cotton or extend soybeans, you tank mix dicamba with glyphosate, you're very likely to miss this because the dicamba antagonizes the glyphosate. It prevents it from working properly, and we have explosions in this particular grass. So this is barnyard grass. This is one that we are quite concerned may actually end up being resistant to glyphosate one day. We got a field, field I sprayed one, two, and four quarts of Roundup Power Max on about 10 days ago. And it's already starting to green back up in the four quart rate. So think about that. Generally one quart controls it. That's what we tell our growers, one quart most likely. This is four. This is a gallon of Power Max and it's greening back up. So it's pretty scary. So remember, with this weed from an identification standpoint, skinny from one aspect, wide from the next aspect, okay? Barnyard grass. Next one is broadleaf signal grass. Uh, there's a good bit of it out here. It's indigenous to the area, and it's really easy to tell apart. First thing I look at, see that little purple color on the, on the collar? But here's the next one. If you look at this, see how one side kind of sticks out wider and the next side slim everybody see that and you got a red collar and the leaves kind of short and fat so short will be about this long tends to be wide and stick out on the collar one side further than the other and it's got a red on it it's going to be broadly sitting grass easily controlled but it is going to be out there the next one that resembles that wide on one side but skinny on the other is brown top millet. This, don't see it so much up in the northeast part of the state. Really, it kind of starts running through here and goes down into the central part of the state. So, barn, brown top millet. Now, you got another millet species that's moving down a red river up from Shreveport. It's called Texas millet. Now, this is one mean son of a gun. Okay? Best way you can know it, Y'all see those little hairs running across the top of that leaf? When you pick that leaf up and rub it on your lip, it feels soft, both sides. No other grass species we have is like that. It's just furry. I mean, it feels good. I mean, you lay down on a bunch of those leaves and take your nap. That's how soft they feel. I'm originally from Alabama. This particular plant is the most in invasive grass species we have, and it's very tough to control. A lot of the herbicides we use We'll control it, but it's, such, it's got such a massive soil seed bank and it germinates so fast and grows so fast, you may think you have it controlled right now, and in two weeks it's back and growing very aggressively. This is moving this way. So we're picking up a lot more, a lot more complaints on Texas millet. So from, from brown top millet, it's not near as heavy, hairy. It's got that cup out on one side from the collar. When you look at the collar, where the leaf comes in to the main stem, all right? This one doesn't do that. It's just real furry. Next one is large crabgrass. Crabgrass is everywhere. It's in your yard. I mean, you can probably walk in anybody's yard in Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, don't matter. You're going to find it. One of the biggest ways to ID it is A, by the seed head, but here at the legule. Now, what is the legule? If you pull up a plant, leaf of grass, and you pull the leaf down, so you got the main stem sticking up, you're going to have something stick out. That's called the ligule and how it looks. Some of them are real short. Some of them are absent. Like barnyard grass doesn't even have one. Some of them are real short, kind of chopped off like a, a, a crew top, crew cut type haircut. And some of them are long and fuzzy like that, kind of like his hair. You know, it just kind of sticks out. All right? So that's large crabgrass, easily controlled. Honestly, to see it out in a grow crop field, it's kind of rare. You see it up more toward the ends, this particular large crabgrass. There's another one called smooth. Smooth doesn't have any hair. That's how you tell it, but smooth is generally a turf weed. Goosegrass. This is the next one I'm concerned about. Uh, you walk through the field, you see a little patch of grass like somebody stepped on it and it's kind of growing flat and it's got a silvery green look to it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You see it. 
Generally, you'll see it in yards where there's a lot of traffic. You sit on golf courses because that's where it grows. Lots compact, compacted areas. It grows flat. Goose grass because the seed head kind of looks like a goose foot, kind of. This particular is flat, and it's not like barnyard grass like I described to you. But the reason it kind of flattens out is because of stepping on it. It just reacts to stepping on it. This particular pest is diff difficult to control. Glyphosate's like barnyard grass. You've got to hold your mouth right to get it. It's got to be small. Liberty does hardly anything to it. And so it's like Liberty releases it. And you can kill all the other grasses with a full rate of Liberty, and this one hangs out. This is resistant to glyphosate in Tennessee. And we've got some locations in South Louisiana that guys are really struggling to control it. And I'm always able to figure out why they didn't control it, not calling it resistance, but it won't be long. Because we're always traditionally about four to five years behind Arkansas and Tennessee when things happen to us. Goose grass. Yellow foxtail. There's three foxtails that are indigenous here. There's giant, there's green, and there's yellow. Giant and green kind of stay in the ditches. We don't deal with them much. Yellow's the one. And how you tell it, obviously, you look at the seed head, it looks like a foxtail. The leaf has hairs on the bottom third. So if that leaf is this long, on the bottom third of it, you'll see little, little hairs like that. Sticking up. Not real dense. Just a bunch of them. It's kind of real long. That's how you tell it apart. Really easy to control. When you see this weed, it's when a guy's done a poor job of doing weed control. Johnson grass, one of my best friends. How many folks have seen Johnson grass before? How many folks have not been able to control it with Roundup before? Okay. This particular weed can propagate via seed, as you see here on the seed head, or rhizomes. Rhizomes are underground root. Kind of looks like your finger. So if you see a big stool, a big clump of Johnson grass this year, and you remember where it is, and you work for Tim next year, and you come back, and it's kind of spread out through the field, you can bet money they ran some sort of tillage equipment, cut those rhizomes up into little segments, and just spread it through the field. Hogs love it. Feral hogs love it. They'll go through and eat the rhizomes. Tear up everything else, but they'll eat the rhizomes. Okay? Prominent white midvein, it'll get rust on the leaves. You can kind of see that reddening right there get like rust on it. And I'm going to tell you a story of how this came around. It's called Johnson grass. It was brought into South Carolina back in the 1800s by Colonel Johnson, former Civil War colonel. He brought it in to graze cattle. It was brought in before the Civil War by him, then he became a colonel. So it was for grazing, right? Well, it just exploded over South Carolina. Well, during the war, when they would come through and they would just destroy plots of land, horses and cannons and everything they thought well, if we'd spread johnson grass as rhizomes that would rehabilitate the land it didn't rehabilitate the land it just caused a pest because it is native to greece and it was brought over here and started in south carolina and spread to johnson grass it is resistant to glyphosate in louisiana and we're feeling pretty positive in spots it may be resistant to select when that happens, when we don't have Roundup and we don't have Select, or Fuselate or any of the others that kill like Select, our only course of action is Liberty. I don't have any other answers. And then it takes at least two to three applications of Liberty to knock it back. So this, this right here, and it's all over Louisiana. This is, this is a real concern of mine going forward. So everybody knows that you can see the rust, prominent white, Mid rib. Purple nut sedge. We have purple and we have yellow. And there's a third one I'm going to show you, but these are the two. All right. Yellow nut sedge, which I'll show you next, is called chufa. Guys will plant it for turkey. Turkey love it. You can buy it. And they're real sweet, just single nutlet. You can chew on them. They're kind of got a sweet taste to them. Purple nut sedge is connected by tubers. It's, they've got the nuts and it's got roots to between them. You bite this, it's real bitter. And it ain't going to kill you if you do it. I mean, it's kind of cool if you do it. The difference between the two, and I'll show this next picture, is 
Purple nut sedge, yellow nut sedge. Yellow nut sedge goes to a, a, a kind of a slope to a main point. Purple nut sedge is kind of fat, and it's like you lopped off at the end and put a point on it. So if it gradually goes down to an end, that's yellow. If it comes up and juts in, like you see the one on the left, that's purple. Why is it important to distinguish it? Yellow is relatively easy to control. We've got some residual herbicides that can control it. we got some post herbicides that control it. Purple, purple by the color of the seed head there, is not that easy to control. So it's, it's good to distinguish between the two so he knows how to plan. Yellow nut sedge, both of them are triangular shaped. See the yellow right there? And remember this. And yellow actually have like a yellow tint to it, kind of a yellow cast, yellowy green. Purple is going to be a darker green, as you can tell them apart. So look at the colors, because you, I doubt you're going to have a seed head out there. And this has gotten real big and got too far along. So yellow cast, kind of yellowy green, slender leaf. It's going to be yellow, obviously. Darker green, kind of comes up and juts in. That's going to be purple nut sedge. The next one's rice flat sedge. This smells great. It smells like a cypress tree. So you can pull it up, roll it in your hand like that. If your hand smells like a cypress tree, that's rice flat sedge. Mainly going to be in areas where there's rice, because obviously rice flat sedge. Wet areas is where you'll see it. It'll come up really, really thick, almost like grass to a field in, in wet areas. So wet areas of fields, low areas drains is where you'll typically see rice flat sedge. And it tends to be hollow. The other two don't generally are not hollow. They're both all three triangular shaped stems, but it'll be hollow. This is Palmer amaranth. We've all heard of Palmer amaranth, Palmer pigweed, resistant to glyphosate, discouraged of the Mid-South and the Southeast and really becoming the scourge of the US. The ways that you can identify it from other pigweeds, it's got a really long petiole. What the petiole is, is, oh, my, my thing died. This right here, if it's really long, that tells you more. Y'all see the little dot on my finger there? That's a seed. The seed is the size of a ball and a ballpoint pen. Will stick to you. If you walk through the field, it's got seed like this, and you, you're going to carry it with you. You can see it on your arms. And wherever you go, flip it off, it's going to come up. The two pictures on the right are their inflorescence. The one on the top is the male. The one on the bottom is the female. So you have separate male and female plants. The male produce pollen. The females produce a seed. The males are soft and cuddly. The females are sticky witches. Okay, now why is that? Well, if a bird wants to eat the seed, you think a bird's going to light on something with a bunch of spines? No. But for the pollen, if the bird lights on it or a bee comes across it, the pollen's going to stick to them. They transfer their pollen. That's the reason for this. This weed is indigenous to the desert southwest. Cotton and soybeans... Generally, when you get about 96 to 97 degrees during the day, it kind of starts to shut down. It's not growing like it properly should. All right. Corn's about 100 degrees. Palm Ram Ram's 109 degrees before it really starts feeling the effect of heat. This, from an overall mechanical standpoint, this may be the perfect plant, the perfect weed. If you want to get rid of it, and you know a lot of people of Asian descent, they love to eat it. You'll see this, like, you know, when you go into a restaurant, they got all those, those you know, you got rid of iceberg salad, salad there, and spinach here, and there's a whole bunch of different color stuff mixed up. Them salads people generally don't like to eat, you're going to find amaranth leaves in that. Next one is what Tim said. Now, what's the difference? Look how wide these leaves are. Almost. Twice, maybe not twice. So if this is, say, four inches, just going to be two to half, maybe three. Okay? Water hemp's different. Water hemp, maybe two and a half to three times as long. So if this is four inches, this is going to be about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. 
Same seed. You have separate male and female plants, just like Palmer. You can't tell them apart. The seed heads look the same. This, when I moved to Louisiana in 2008, there was more of this in the state, particularly in central Louisiana, than there was Palmer. We identified as being resistant to glyphosate. So, Palmer amaranth, common water hemp. The next pigweed species is slender amaranth. You see this everywhere. This is one you kind of see growing around your house. Just jumps up and grows. All right. Kind of nasty, gnarled looking seed head, little bitty fart. You can't, when they're in this stage, really it's hard to tell them apart. But slender amaranth is really easily, easily controlled right now. But it still has the same kind of viable seed. And this one has the male, male and female parts are on the same plant. So they're, they're monoecious. Red root pigweed, major indigenous pigweed species here in Louisiana. Looks a lot like Palmer, long petiole here, but you'll generally see like a thumbprint, like a white spot on the leaves and kind of ruffled edges. You pull it up, it's got a red root. Now, here's a kicker to all of it. Palmer amaranth, water hemp, slender amaranth, red root pigweed, um, prostrate pigweed, I can name them all. They all cross. So what happens when they cross? They all start to look the same. Used to be that little white spot on the leaf was always either smooth or red root pigweed. Always. Palmer Amaranth has it now. Used to be that you didn't see the long petioles on red root pigweed. Look at that long petiole on that red root pigweed. Because they're crossing. They're crossing. So my advice to you guys is say, Tim, you got pigweeds. I know it's either water hemp, it's pretty easy to tell, or it's a pigweed or something, and this is the density we got them. Because it may be this, it may be on the red root, but if it's crossed, it may be resistant to glyphosate. We haven't found it yet, but it's, it's known. They, they, um, they sequenced the genome of this, and they found it's just so screwed up and so diverse, they can't tell it apart. And to give you an example, they sequence the common house fly and the human genome, and we ain't that different. The house fly and the human ain't that different. This one was so jacked up between species. Within a species, it was hard enough to kind of pick out genetically to tell what it is. And these guys right here, before they put on a seed head, particularly the palmer amaranth and water hemp, or the palmer amaranth in particular, you can't tell if it's a boy or a girl. And here's the nut thing of it. Scientists can't tell either, looking at the genetics. We think it determines whether it's going to be a boy or a girl based off the environmental stress that's going through. Environmental stress being what we apply to it with herbicides or farming or what nature applies to it. So think about it. These are some mean boys and girls. Entirely morning glory. Morning glory is my favorite. And I'm going to tell you all a story about one in a minute. This is entire leaf. It's a heart-shaped leaf. It's real fuzzy. When you pick up the leaf, you put it close to your ear, and you kind of, it'll crunch, almost. You see, this, this is the leaf. Just kind of hit it with your fingers like that. It'll crunch. All right. Generally, from the, the cotyledons here, it's got, it's got a butt, but no hips. See his butt right there, but no hips. Kind of wide. The next one is an, an ivy leaf. Ivy leaf has got the same cotyledon. The difference is look at the leaf shape and it crunches too. They're, they're both the same species that are different varieties of it. Both of these you'll see in Louisiana. And there are differences in the way herbicides can control some of these. The third one is palm leaf. Now, this one's got a little butt with a little bit of a hip. So this is a skinny person. A little bit of butt and see how long it is. Long legs, a little bit of hip, a little bit of butt. Versus this one, big old butt. Probably no hips. Some of the ways you can tell. And I ain't expecting you guys to know that right now. But just to tell you, there's ways you can identify these. Your biggest thing is the crunching on the leaf. That tells you exactly what it is. Palm leaf, this is easy. 
You want to take these home and put them on a trellis that's so pretty at your house, the way these leaves are shaped. I see this predominantly, Tim, Southern Rapids and South. Mm -hmm. Pity morning glory. This is probably one of the more predominant pigweed species. If you look around the leaf edge of this, pitted has a butt and hips. Y'all see that? See that purple margin going around it? It'll be on these leaves, different leaf shapes. So this is one and this is one. Kind of notice this is more of an arrow shaped versus a heart shaped. Pity. I did my entire dissertation growing this particular plant. I grew it on trellises. I collected pigweeds from its indigenous range, as if you imagine, go from southern Delaware. So, morning glory, pity. Delaware through central Missouri, down through eastern Texas, so everywhere east and south of that. We collected seed, and I grew them on tre trellises and compared how they grew different. So what's the difference? From emergence to flowering, one from Delaware was about 50 days. The one from Baton Rouge, from emergence to flowering, was close to 90 days. Now why? They're photoperiodic, just like a soybean is. You plant a group four soybean and a group five soybean on the same day, that four is going to start flowering before that five. It depends on day length, or length of night, actually. These are the same. So down south, they'll get a hell of a lot bigger than they will up in the north. But purple margins, that's the biggest thing. Pity morning lords, purple margins. My wife can identify this, so I hope y'all can too. Hemp says baney, also known as coffee bean or coffee weed, as they call it through here. Really easy to tell. The biggest thing to identify this versus another one called joint veg looks similar. The, there's the cotyledons. The first leaf is a, a simple leaf. The next one's a compound. This is a leaf. These are leaflets, just like soybeans. A soybean leaf is all three of those little leaves. So you got a trifoliate. That's a leaf. Then you have trifoliates. So if you're counting leaves for Tim, they said, what stage are those soybeans? You count trifoliates. All right? You count up to them. You say they're, they're five. That tells Tim they're, they're V5 soybeans. Vegetative growth five, because they've got five trifoliates. All right? This is hemp says mania. It's a sickle pod. Don't see a lot of it here. But it is a legume. That looks kind of like a peanut, doesn't it? Anybody ever seen peanuts growing? Looks a little bit like peanuts. This son of a gun stinks. Stinks. Easy to smelling when you're walking through a field. How many folks have seen this one? How many folks know what is teaweed? This is prickly cider, also known as teaweed. I'm going to show you a comparison of some things in, in, as we go through, but this has got a woody stem. All right. Its cousin is called arrowleaf cider, which arrowleaf cider would be smooth to this point and then jag around. So smooth here, and then you get the serrations. The next one we'll see a lot of is hop horn beam copper leaf. Now, if you just look at the serrations, you can kind of see how it might be mistaken for prickly cider. The one big difference is prickly cider, there's his cotyledons, and his true leaves are above the cotyledons. You see that? There's a cotyledon, which is the first two leaves that come out, and the next leaves that grow are the true leaves. So the on prickly cider, they're above. Copper leaf, the cotyledons are above the true leaves. All day, every day. And we're going to talk about the shape. I want you to notice the round, kind of an egg, round looking shape of these. Third is Texas weed. You see this mostly in rice areas or in wet areas. Notice the serrations of the leaves. Look at the cotyledons how big they are. And we're going to go to all three of them to kind of compare them for you. On the left is prickly cider. In the middle is hop on bean copper leaf. And on the right is Texas weed. The two you guys are going to see mostly in cotton and, and um, soybean country are going to be the two on the right. 
two on the left, I mean. Think of it this way. Y'all know the difference between a ripping saw and a finishing saw? Yes or no? Ripping saw has got big teeth spread apart so it can rip more wood. Right? Finishing saw, smaller teeth, closer so it's more finer cut. Prickly side is a ripping saw. Poplar beam copper leaf is a finishing saw. Ripping saw. See that? Ripping saw. Finishing saw. Rip. Finish. You can look at the serrations, how close they are and how small they are, and know the difference between the two. Texas weed. Generally, Texas weed is just kind of uh, almost got like a bunch of wrinkles in the leaves. And the leaves are longer, so it kind of differentiates itself pretty easy. Y'all probably won't see much Texas weed. How many folks have seen this? Smell melon. Dicamo, yeah, that's true. Real easy to tell. Looks like a watermelon coming out of the ground or a cucumber. They're all cucumbers. They're all within the same um, family. Those little balls right there. The problem with those little things, those the, the fruits, is you want to screw up the moisture on a load of soybeans. You get a bunch of balls in there when they bust. And they don't, it's not that they, they call them smell melon. They don't stink. But it's not a pleasant odor. So if you had one in your hands, like, oh, that doesn't smell. It's not like it's going to run you off from smelling it. But it doesn't smell good. And those things hurt if you want to throw them at each other and hit each other with them. Red vine or buck vine? I'm sure you've seen this. This is pretty predominant from, from central north. Get a little bit. This is a perennial weed. It's got a root stock on it pretty deep. So it doesn't grow from a seed. It's a perennial weed. And any herbicide that we use now is just kind of burning the leaves off. You need to attack this in the fall. But it's real. It's got a reddish tint to it. So if you look across the field and you see kind of just a, in clumps, this big stuff has got a reddish green tint to it, that's not going to be a morning glory. It's going to be red vine or buck vine. Two, ragweed parthenium. Ragweed parthenium, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's really within the last six, seven years it has become a problem. Paraquat, which, you know, I know paraquat, right? Gramoxone. Anything it touches, it burns, right? It's so cool. Doesn't do anything to it. Glyphosate depends on how you hold your mouth. It's good or bad. When it's small, it'll look kind of like this and get and it'll stay in a rosette stage, kind of growing flat and get bigger and bigger and bigger. We can kill it then, kind of. But when it bolts, we're down to a couple of heavy hitters spraying them about two to three weeks apart, really doing anything. Then we just kind of, it just stays there. It never, it doesn't just melt and vanish. But you'll hear white flower, white top. It's actually called in California Santa Marie fever. And it has been documented as resistance to glyphosate in Texas and Florida. How many folks have seen this? It comes up. This is called narrow leaf pale seed. We got a bunch of it on the station. It's indigenous. It's going to emerge in late April into May, right when we're trying, we're planting and we put out our first roundup application because glyphosate is not that good on it. And it hangs out and it hangs out and you think, oh my gosh, and guys want to pour money to it. And all of a sudden when it gets warm, it's gone. It vanishes. But it's a pretty cool weed to tell this out there. So y'all know it's nearly pale sea. How many folks have seen this one? You think it's a purse lane, horse purse lane, all right? Because the next one is common purse lane, which we'll get to in a minute. Common purslane, the next one over, is a plant from the desert southwest. It's a portulaca. It's in a family. This one is, in, is a succulent. It's just like a cactus type plant. This really has been growing everywhere. So many in the turn rows mainly you'll see it. Rarely do you see it out in the field. It's pretty easy to kill. It just gets so big and ugly. Guys get all scared and nervous about it. 
it's not that big of a deal. It's on turn roads. Things die pretty easily to it. Common person is a little bit different. Doesn't respond that well to glyphosate. But you're not really going to see it out in the field. Any kind of dirt work, you don't see it. All right, and we generally do conventional tillage. You're just going to pick up common personal lane, typically in a no-till situation. I don't know of anybody in Louisiana that's no-till. If they try to be no-till, it gets wet when they harvest, they mess up the rows, they got to rip them out and start over. That gets rid of no-till. No so common personal lane and horse personal lane. So wide, fat leaves, more narrow leaves, they're both going to be really thick. They're both going to be really soft. You almost could pick these things. You actually could get this one up. You've got enough in your hand, you squeezed it, you can get water out of it. So here's the test. What's up there? Well, let's look. Let's look at grass. Here's what I advise you to do. Look at your grasses first. Take them out first. So you see grasses. You see short and fat. What did I tell you had short and fat leaves? Barnyard grass have short and fat leaves? No. Brown top millet, Texas millet. Probably a sit on grass. That's good. You've, you've, you've gone from this huge group of weeds, of grasses, down to a little bit. Then you pull it up, and if it's not fuzzy, if it doesn't feel real soft, you know it's not Texas millet. So now you got it down to two. That's good enough for 10. The next ones go your pig weeds. Grasses and then pig weeds. Look at your pig weeds. What have I got? Long petioles. Kind of getting that round looking fashion as they emerge. Leaves are about just a little bit longer than they are wide. Palm amaranth. You nailed it. Okay. Then you go to everybody else. What else do you see? I generally go morning glories next. Grass, pigweeds, morning glories. That's how I look at things. Here's your morning glories. Heart shaped leaves. That's got a purple margin around it. Okay. That's pity morning glory. But you've identified it as the morning glory. That's good enough for Tim. I don't think you want them to go down species, Tim, do you? So morning glory. So now you've got, you've got grass, Tim. I think it's one of these two or three. I know you've got pigweeds. I'm pretty sure it's Palmer. Because you know water hemp from Palmer, right? Water hemp's kind of long not as, and, and narrow. Pigweeds or Palmer amaranth's a little bit wider. Then what else you see out there? You start seeing these guys. The serrated leaves. And you think, is it a ripping saw or is it a finishing saw? Hell, that's a ripping saw. That's tea weed. And what else you got out there? Occasionally, right there. Most likely a horse person lane. That's out there. But what you've effectively done for Tim is he knows he's got grasses, he knows he's got pigweeds, he knows he's got vine, he's got tea weed. Those are the four main ones, in my opinion, that most consultants will make their suggestions for herbicides around. Okay, if you don't have pigweeds, it changes everything. If you don't have tea weeds, if all you had was grass and morning glories out there, it is easy. That's easy from a suggestion from him. If he's got pigweeds, then it changes. If you take pigweeds out and put tea weed in, it changes. If you put them both in there, it changes everything. So just by him knowing those four, grass, pigweed, morning glories, tea weed, anything else he's going to pick up with something of those treatments to control those four. All right? Grass. What's first? We're going to look at grass. What are we going to next? It's interactive. We looked at grass. What are we going to next? Pigweeds. Then we're going to morning glories. And what we're going to do next? We're going to look for tea weed. Okay? Any questions? Is it over y'all's head? Biggest, what I see from you guys, and I, you don't work for me. Just tell me what's out there. Tell me you got grasses. If you don't know what it is, don't can't beat yourself up. He knows it. And he probably knows what's out there just based off history. But you got grasses. Tim, you got pigweeds. This is important. If he's not seen pigweeds on a farm and you find it, you need to know where, what area, because they'll move into an area. Maybe he could focus 
a different treatment in an area and save that farmer some money. The next one's vines. We're going to have vines. Vines are indigenous here, but it kind of changes what he's going to do a little bit, but he knows what to do. Tea weeds, that's important. Do you have tea weeds? Because tea weeds can be here one year and not be there the next, and then come back the next year. Okay? Grass, pigweed, morning glory, tea weed. 